Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are talking today about something that, well, it's touchy by its very nature. Yes. We're going to talk about what it's like to come to terms with the fact that we are not the people we thought we were. Yeah. You're not who I thought you were, and I'm not who I thought I was, and I'm not who you thought I was. And It got messy really got quick. Messy real just fast. while we were trying to decide how to talk about this, mm -hmm. we were just listening to um, Thomas Hubel talking about um, trauma in relationships. And it's one of the things that Ken and I do. We listen to other relationship people talk about relationships. Um, it gets very meta very fast. We'll be relational about, about relationships. We will be relational but about um, relationships. Thomas Hubel said something. It was quippy and cute, um, but very powerful at the same time. He said, marriage is the time when you find out what was already there on your first date. And I said something similar in Project Relationship in the book. Um, I said that there's this moment in the early time when you you just imagine the other person to be all this stuff that you disowned from yourself. Right. So I was taught to call that the golden shadow, that we project all these things, all this stuff we wish we had projected out all over this person who, yeah, sort of embodies that. Could. Could, <laughs> maybe. But actually, they're complicated, flawed individuals. Yeah. And... I'm a complicated, flawed individual. And, and so we spend our time together discovering all the parts of us that we misunderstood or missed or, yeah, wanted or to be there. Or misrepresented. Or misrepresented. Because, yes, and this is where sure. I thought, okay, we can really get into this because this is sticky mm -hmm. and messy and hard to own. Yep. But it's not just about, hey, I, I projected onto you. So a thing that I projected onto you was intelligence. Mm -hmm. You are an intelligent person. But I have my kind of intelligence. Right. but And you, you are an intelligent person. <clears throat> but the more important thing in that those early days for me was that I had projected onto you the intelligence I wished that I had. Right. And, and in doing so, I disowned my actual intelligence. Oh, yeah. I, I projected it onto you. It's like I gave you the quality of intelligence. And I was like, so I won't be the intelligent one here. It was such an interesting thing to have done because up until then I thought of myself as pretty bright, but not, I don't know. There was just some, there was this moment where I was like, so you're going to be the intelligent one in our relationship. And I started disassociating myself with that concept because it was all yours. Yeah, and that you, is interesting to to have given it away and not I, shared it, you know, not right? Said, oh, I don't, and I too. don't know, and it I want. It's, I mean, it's not like it was quite that simple. No, of course but not. But in hindsight, I can see very clearly where I did this, where I I disengaged from that word and said, okay, so I'll, d and I started deferring <laughs> certain things to you, imagining that you had the capacity to to think through and and puzzle out certain problems. Um, and I deferred and I, and I handed those things to you and neglected to attend to my own intelligence for a while. And, and that was on the order of months and even a couple years, maybe, while you had to decide what to do with that. And I don't mean consciously. This was unconscious well, that's the thing. stuff. We did, it's not like we had conversations about this no. at all. So it was all under the surface. No. But you responded to that projection mm -hmm. yeah, really strongly. What was it like for you on your side? So um, as somebody who had who values the qualities you were you were putting on me, like, ooh, maybe I am. And I will, I will hmm, I would like to say 
that I responded by saying, oh, I'll live up to them. But no, what I did was accept them as though they were true without evidence. And then, and then that I didn't have to back it up with evidence. Mm. So in some ways, I actually backed off from my own aspirations. Right. It was, so this because is Because I accepted the, the right. label. I remember feeling in early days, the joy of having you um, put a label on some quality that you saw in me. I liked some of those labels so much that I tattooed them on my body. <laughs> yes. I, I took those things. Yeah. Um, so for me, that took the form of um, you said to me on the on the day you first said you loved me, you said that you appreciated so much my passion and my intensity for all of life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, that hasn't gone Somebody away. Somebody gets me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm that. Yes, absolutely. And so I, ta I, I got them translated into um, Japanese kanji and I had them tattooed on my back. And well, there's a whole story that goes along with that that I'll save for another time. Um, but I took those qualities that you had seen and I, I wanted to own them. And that was important. But I also, I felt the need to, yeah, somehow prove them bear them out. And those were good qualities. It's true. But I also felt some narrowness. Like, okay, that's who he sees me as. So be that. Uh, be passionate. Mm. Be intense. And um, yeah, there was a certain lack of well-roundedness. I see what you're saying. And I think a lot of us get into that in early stages in our relationship. We show a certain amount of ourselves to each other. And then later <laughs> later there's all the, the everything stuff. yeah so including all the traumas and the yeah mess and all of that because living together the way we do um it's uh it's it's hard to hide things even if i want to like if okay uh, this this part of me i don't i don't know that i'm comfortable with it and want to fit it into our lives but everything comes out everything is and I think um, that's part of it. That's what Thomas Hubel was talking about. Yeah, so marriage yep. or any long-term committed mm -hmm. relationship, especially if you live with someone, there's a limit to how much hiding you yeah. can really do. Um, though you lived in a marriage where hiding was easier. Prior to this marriage, you lived in a marriage yes. where hiding um, yourself was easier. So let's let's not forget that either. And that's possible. hard for me to remember. I um I'm not good at hiding. Hiding is not my go-to move. Um, but what was that like? What's the difference for you from being able to hide in a relationship if you want, or let's call this being able to live with the imagination that you really are those labels mm -hmm. without having to prove it, without having to show it or live up to it. So right off the top of my head, what I immediately see is, um, in my previous marriage, we were two avoidant people, which meant if something if a sticky spot came up, our go-to move was to just avoid dealing with it. So I didn't just have to hide. It was being actively looked away from. Okay. So if something came up, it didn't need to become part of our relational experience because I could try to hide it and she would look around. She would just like paint over it. So that's a thing that on. you were practicing. Yeah, so it just... was a, a pretty consistent practice of that that combination of things that let a lot of stuff say stay hidden for for both of us and and that's the interesting thing about that to me is that it let it stay hidden from you so so yeah. i remember in our when we first started to get to be friends you and i we would talk about what you were doing in your life to to live more deeply and live more yeah. fully and you were going through a lot of um, nature programs at the time yep. And you were exploring your inner world and some stuff needed to come out of hiding. Is yeah. That's what it looked like and sounded like in those mm -hmm. early conversations. And this is going back 15 years, 16 years now. Um, but That's many years. Wow. Yeah, but it's been right. a while. That it's is been how a while. long it's been. Wow. But um, I remember you saying that there were these parts of you that had sort of come forward. You were, you know, you'd go and you'd you do an adventure or you or you you do some survival trip or um, a fast in the woods or something like that and 
and some new part of you would become accessible. Yeah. Um, I remember very clearly a time when you told me that you had you had sort of met your 17 year old self. Yes. And I I don't know. Do you want to say something about that? Because I it feels powerful. Well, these the, parts of ourselves. That yeah. We, the the nature programs that 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 I the way that they worked for me was I by going I was establishing a relationship with myself ultimately that I hadn't hadn't had I hadn't been working on that and I wasn't even working on it consciously then but that's what it came that's what came out when I would go out into these these situations with you know just trees and whatnot around me um it was just me and them and so I talked to me <laughs> and what um what I found in this one particular instance was I actually had a long conversation with my 17 year old self and that was extremely valuable to me because, and Thomas Hubel mentioned this, I think it was him, could have been Terry Real, um, mentioned um, um, finding parts of myself that um, accessing the qualities that this part of me that had been sort of locked away or isolated in time, the qualities that they had that mm. I didn't have access to as well anymore. And so when you froze that part yeah. of yourself, that 17 mm -hmm. year old part of yourself, which yeah. there's a good reason that there's some frozen stuff for you yep. around 17. When you froze that, you're saying some qualities and aspects of you got frozen along mm -hmm. with that frozen in time, right. that 17 year old state. Now your father died when you were 17. So there's, yeah, some there's stuff a very happened. clear reason why and, you would have had some locking up and, yep. and all some that's capital T trauma stuff. But, and, um, and I think, so you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of giving away the, the qualities of intelligence to me, I gave away the quality of intense and intensity and passion to you. I didn't realize that until you just said it now. And I heard you describe it and I could feel <laughs> how I was like, oh, that's your thing. Yes, that's totally it. And that it was how it felt. Mm -hmm. It felt like you were. You, it felt like you were giving it to me, recognizing it in me, and at the same time, making somehow, you responsible for bringing it to our whole life. But, but at the same time, exactly like yeah. now, you were no longer responsible for needing to be yeah. intense or passionate, which is such a fascinating thing for a guy who, when I met him, was essentially a bubbling cauldron. <laughs> yeah, underneath the surface, yep. it was bubbling and bubbling. And so you had gone out and had this long conversation with your 17 year old self, what part of yourself did you reclaim? Well, that my, my joy and intensity, uh, that's, that's the part that I intentionally, we, we decided together was, okay, this is, he, he's like, this is what I've got. I was like, okay, I can see that. And I see that I haven't had it. So I'm going to pick it up. Let's, let's bring it out. Yes. You get to be here with out, out among everything and not locked away in this place anymore, but um, and, and here you are. And so, yeah, it was joy, intensity, a little bit of creativity. Um, but those kinds of life force, um, uh, there was a playfulness, playfulness. Yes. I remember you bringing that back. So I was, um, I was, I was in your life back then as a friend. And I remember you, um, starting to embody some more of that, starting mm -hmm. to make some things happen. But I also remember a, a stalling out that happened yes. that summer. Mm -hmm. I remember you sort of hitting the wall that summer and as a friend going to you and, and trying to like, what's, yeah. what's happening? What's going on? Cause you're, you, you were kind of, you were lashing out at, yeah inside friendships and and not showing up the, with the kindness that I had seen you show up with so frequently it was hard to figure out what to do it was you very been... immature like the energy that yeah, I so... that I released it was still 17 and younger and it was immature okay so I'm, I am now drawing this connection between you you recognize that energy that 17 year old energy and you so you pulled it forward and and we're like okay i'm gonna embody that just <laughs> just a couple years ago our oldest um son went away with you to a nature program yeah and came back 17 years old came back right. 
and had an extremely similar situation. Didn't he though? And You're since right. this was my story, I interacted with him about this. So I'll share it from this perspective. Like he, he brought back with him some intensity and I, he, I got pointed right at me mm -hmm. on one particular evening, just over a dinner. It was not a huge deal. Um, the whole situation got remedied fairly quickly, but he brought forward this intense, um, immature, um, rageful ownership stuff. It was, it was very, very it's intense. Black and white thinking. Black and it white was, thinking. Very, um, it was very intense. And I, I contained it in that moment. Okay. I think I, I managed it. Okay. But I didn't realize until we just were, we're talking about it now that I recognize that energy in him as being so similar to early days in my romantic relationship with you, that intensity, uh -huh. that rage, right. that, um, that frustration, mm -hmm. that, that thwarted power that then seemed to just like brew. I don't, I'm, I'm having trouble yeah. even putting it into words. I don't think I'd noticed how much of you when we first started um, being romantically involved 12 years ago, I don't think I had noticed how much of you was, um, was really that, that 17 year old boy yeah. trying to figure out how, to, how he got to live in the world, how he got to bring those gifts of it intensity and passion and complicated and hard and confusing. And everybody around me was affected by that confusion. Mm. Getting to know you as a partner has been, it's been fascinating because I am the kind of person who tends to judge quickly. Um, I, I tend to, to jump to conclusions faster than is necessarily a good idea. And so I imagined in early days that, that I knew who you were. Mm -hmm. And I still fall into that trap sometimes of imagining that I know who you are um, mm -hmm. I was glad to come across a tool for, for trying to undo some of that because what I'm, what I'm thinking right now is that we are, we're always in this process of becoming yeah. whoever we're going to be. And it's easy for me to take that seriously in regards to myself. Uh, I'm becoming, I'm changing. I'm not one thing. I'm always in a process, but to accidentally treat you as though I know exactly who mm. you are. I know who you are. And then when you aren't that, or when you show me some other part of you to react, to react to that, to not stay in my, in my mature adult self and remember, oh, right. He's in the process of becoming. That cannot possibly feel good when I do that. Well, we all, um, we all seek stability. And this, the kind of growth that you and I work on explicitly in our relationship is a little bit at odds with the concept of like long-term stability. Okay. I'm married to this person. This is, we are, we are doing all the things together for decades Which means we're tangled to come, up together. And we're tangled up together. And oh, now you're changing. That's a little disconcerting. And we live with that discomfort because we value the growth. But I have, I felt lucky to to have um, this tool that I use to remind me that you are growing and changing. And that is- What um, is that tool? Well, I don't even know whether you know I do this. I might not. <laughs> um, so every time you hand me something, every single time you hand me something, okay. I try to, um, I, I, I use that as a habit trigger to remind me that I don't know you to take this thing from you as if I don't know you. I didn't know you did that. No. So I sometimes I respond by asking you a question. I'll try to ask you a question in that moment. And sometimes I just try to look at you and I'll actually tip my head or something and mm. try to ch literally Get change my view on you. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I put that into place several years ago. It was on purpose because I noticed that I, I was getting some fixed mindset mm. around the idea of who you are. You are, almost 10 years older than I am. You have life experiences I do not have because I, I spent my 20s having babies and not really, it was very different life. I didn't go explore anything. I didn't travel. I didn't, yeah, it was just very different. So I have seen you as this very mature, grown up person who knows the world in a way I don't know. It's helpful to remember every day 
day after day, every time you hand me something, it's been really helpful to just remember, oh, wait, he's also a little kid and playful and challenging and confused and um, and knowing and calm and passionate. It's not, I, I don't so much label you. I just try to look at you with this curiosity mm -hmm. just for, even if it's just for three seconds, just something. Well, it it sounds like the opposite of labeling. It's like and you okay, know how I love labels. I do, and so for a moment you suspend them all and see what you see. Yeah, I I started doing it. I don't have it. a clear <laughs> uh, habit trigger like that, but we um, there are a couple things we do. I mean, you just mentioned yesterday you offered to some people that you were working with to oh go to your partner, ask them a question, and. Um, you like abandon the idea that you already know what the answer is going to be and see what happens. And I see you do that with me all the time. And I, I don't do it as often with you, but I, I do try. And so we have the cards that we, we use. The Yeah. Uh, there are tons of different, um, the, uh, thing, the and company the has and. some great cards. If you're and looking for just curious prompts, prompts for, some things to ask. Yeah. I have, there's one on my website. Um, if you go to joliehamilton.com, there's, um, the curiosity, yeah, curiosity date, date. Mm -hmm. hundred questions to ask with a fresh mind Yeah, with the idea that you don't know who's in front of you and, uh, asking. So I have a bad habit of asking the same question over and over and mm -hmm. the particular way I do it can be kind of annoying, but from a relational point of view over time, ask the questions you think, you know, the answer to again. And see what happens because we all grow, we all change, and that has been very valuable in learning. I who think, you are. yeah, I think that's actually been important for me. Is it reminds me that you're letting me change, letting me. It's not for you to let me, but but I'm not resisting. You're not resisting it, and you're not you're not um, pretending that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I've changed so much over the course of our relationship, and I'm so glad. I'm not ashamed of who I was when we first started being romantic partners but i i hold her in this sort of tender oh my god girl what the heck were you doing yeah. i don't <laughs> i i don't know what i, I was doing I, that. yeah so i'm grateful that you ask me questions to get an updated mm -hmm. perspective on who i am and what matters to me and what I see, how I see the world. Because what I hear when you're asking me those questions is that you want to be able to put yourself in my shoes for a moment yeah. and just yeah. see how I see the world. Mm -hmm. And um, a question that I ask you over and over again that I don't know whether it gets annoying, but I ask you, it's a very simple question. What's your favorite color mm -hmm. and why? And where do you see it in the world? And I ask it with genuine curiosity, I wonder. Well, it's purple. It's I like looking at amethysts, and um, <laughs> it just feels rich and fun to me. Well, there you go. So I, I do. So I ask you these questions. Now, all of a sudden, the answer can change. Yeah. But sometimes they're big, deep questions, and it can be unsettling yes. to hear you answer in a new way. And it sometimes is I've asked you questions about like what you're looking for in another partner mm -hmm. or um, whether you're planning to date, you know, like when you're planning to like, we've been in COVID for a long time. When are you planning to yeah. date? And I get an answer that I'm like, Ooh, Oh, that set off all of my, all of my nervous system is now yeah. lit up Hello. and I got some stuff to deal with. And I, I find that when you ask those kinds of questions, um, I have, been constantly learning over the years how to manage the way it feels to know that my answer might disturb you and give you the real answer anyway. Yeah. Because I have this bad habit of trying to manage your experience of the world. And it's, it's, oh God, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me it because it comes it's from not a lot the, of different directions. Yeah, but. it's not just that you're trying to manage my perspective of you. I don't want to be responsible for your pain. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Which is a really it's not unproductive. Okay. Yeah. It's not it's terribly not okay. productive because I actually like discomfort quite a lot. Yeah. And we cut our teeth, our relationship teeth, doing very uncomfortable things. Yeah. And I mean, like like it, uncomfortable workouts and races yep, yep. and um, divorces and trying to figure out what to, how to raise children together. 
uh, like out of the blue. Like, yeah. and so we, we did that. We practiced doing uncomfortable things together, but you are very uncomfortable with causing me discomfort. Yeah. But all that did was invite me in the early stages. All that did was invite me into to having hide. to hide yeah. when I was uncomfortable rather than say, that makes me uncomfortable and I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still present. So that's a bad immature habit I have. So that's of... a habit, but I see you leaning away from it. And my, one of my habits that stops me from seeing you as updating is um, taking you too literally. Oh, jeepers, don't do that. <laughs> I'm not a good enough communicator for anyone to take me literally. Right. And so that that's where it becomes really important for me to remember that you at, you really need a chance to express yourself and then turn the ideas and words over in your in your mind and in your mouth and express yourself again and try the idea on yeah. and you make statements you have mm. a tendency to make statements where you mean to where I mean posit to ideas posit a, you're a sort of you want to just like yeah hypothesis you mean to be questioning and yep. trying stuff on but you have this but statement i try it on, thing. and and i know why i do it but it, it does it's not okay i mean the, the fact of it is is not okay i do it because in my mind i'm like what does it feel like if this were true and then i say it as though it were true rather than saying hey i'm trying this on and this is what in your yeah. your younger years got you into trouble because people, well, not actually didn't get you into trouble, but stopped you from relating to people for real. Yeah. As, a, as an outsider and then as a person who was be becoming friends with you, I noticed that because you stated things with such authority, you were so authoritative, um, people didn't always question you yeah. when they really should they really, have. really, really should have. And I came along and I just asked the questions. All of them. It like, was awesome. It was like great. all the questions. And uncomfortable because I wasn't used to it. And, and uh, it was great. I think it's been good for both of us because I didn't realize that I, how comfortable I was challenging authority. Mm. But in fact, that's great for me. I like that. And I don't mean, I don't even mean just breaking down systems though. I'm, I'm game for that. But also just challenging my own sense of authority, challenging my mm. own, like, what is this hierarchy I, of ideas I have? What have I given too much attention to and what am I not paying attention to? You helped me remember that it was always possible to question a statement. That just because By constantly making statements that you felt right, that I needed to question. exactly. Absolutely. And so that le let me discover who you were by pushing and pulling and prodding. And it we had to really bear with that process. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been comfy no, at all. No. If anyone out there is thinking, I don't want to do all of that. This is just one way to relate. It's a way that works yeah, for us. Right. This what but I do. but I think almost anybody can benefit. Their relationship can benefit from pointing curiosity at it mm -hmm. because it is just so easy to imagine that we know the people, especially the people who we live with. So this does, isn't just your romantic partner, but your children. Um, I heard a wonderful question years ago that I try to ask my kids from time to time, what do I need to know about you to be a better mom for you? Um, and I put that in a bunch of different ways, but it's the same. What do I need to know about you, Ken, in order to be a better partner for you? Well, that's a really good question. And yeah, that's, that is a very helpful question. So I think asking those questions of ourselves and our partners is a way to leave behind the idea that we have to know the answer already. Something I hear all the time when I'm working with clients is, he should just know. He's known me mm. long enough. He should just know. But what if, what if there is no should there? Yeah. What if it's always a process of helping each other know who we are now what if that's just what it is um one of the things i help people do is move from hinting and hoping and hiding into a process an intentional process of exchanging ideas and collaborating getting on the same page starting to be a team yeah. with your partner and that's that's a whole set of skills that um i i know that i don't have enough experience with to do it as well as I want to with you. But they're skills and we're always they're building skills them. skills that can be practiced practice and them. improved on. Mm -hmm. 
And right at their core is being curious about who I am and who I am telling you I am. Right. Yeah. And who you are and who you're telling me that you are. And yeah, I'm so grateful to be on that journey with you. Oh, yes. So am I. Awesome. Well, until next time, stay curious. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>